Hello there, uh, Adam Locke here, Michigan State University. I just uh, put together a few slides here in response to uh, a number of emails and phone calls I received uh, since the end of last week from since some um, articles have come out in Canada mostly and uh, as the BBC News uh, yesterday termed Buttergate. So just been asked a few times about this to comment so I thought I'd put a few slides to try and uh, put some of my thoughts down here into into this little video um, and some of the science behind uh, how milk fat's made. So I hope this is helpful and uh, interesting to, to, to different people. So as we said, uh, I guess coming from the UK, we you know it's hit the hit the news big time when uh, when it's on the homepage of the BBC News uh, last night and this morning. What they called Buttergate? Why are Canadians complaining hard about hard butter? I think this has come about the last uh, few. Uh, Last week or so now, because of some anecdotal evidence or people talking about uh, butter not being as soft now at room temperature as it was, I assume, maybe sometime last year. And uh, some uh, food experts have uh, discussed this, what they call the use of palm fats in dairy cow feed as a culprit. So obviously, with some of our uh, research last uh, eight or nine years around uh, palmitic acid, different fatty acid blends uh, had a number of uh, questions about this. Uh, these are a couple of the key articles that I was sent out of Canada. Uh, the first one here talking about uh, use of palm oil in the dairy industry. And this one just simply asking, is your butter harder than usual? And could it be this single feed ingredient that has something to do with it? So, um, you know, coming from a science perspective, I wanted to talk some more about this. Uh, so let's do a little bit of background here. Let's remember about the importance of milk, uh, milk fat in terms of the physical properties, manufacturing characteristics and the organoleptic qualities of milk and dairy products. Of course, wherever you are in the world, milk fat has an economic value and that can <laughs> vary uh, month to month for sure. Um, as I just told a reporter earlier on, I think milk fat is probably the most diverse lipid matrix you can find anywhere in nature. There's over been over 400 different fatty acids been identified in milk. Uh, main reason being that unique rumen fermentation that, that all ruminants undergo and the fact that we get lots of bacterial derived lipids in milk. And we have this whole range from four carbons up to 18 carbons, 20 carbons and longer in milk fat. Very diverse matrix. And the other aspect of that, and we're going to talk more about this later on, is that those fatty acids are found on triglycerides with a wide range of molecular weights. And we'll talk about the importance of that as we go through here. Uh, just borrow this from uh, the milkfacts.info website. You know, milk fat can melt over a wide temperature range uh, from, from a negative 40 up to over 100, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this is illustrated quite simply, and I think this is where maybe some of the uh, misperceptions are lately, um, is that, um, but you know, butter at room temperature versus a, a refrigerated butter um, have much different abilities to, to spread straight away. You know, at a refrigerated temperature, butter is approximately 50% solid, but at uh, room temperature is only about 20% solid. Now, of course, that amount of solid at what we call room temperature is going to depend on what temperature your room is at as well. You know, as I said to someone uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, you know, I know our house here, we don't keep it at the same temperature in the winter as we do in the summer, whether we're heating or cooling the house. So these things can have quite, quite big differences. I know our butter um, that we keep out on our kitchen countertop in the summer months is much softer than the butter we keep out in exactly the same place in the winter months. Um, the key thing here is that the melting properties of milk are a result of the melting uh, points of the different fatty acids that make up milk fat and how particularly they're arranged on that triglyceride molecule. You know, milk fat is about 98% triglycerides and these are in uh, milk fat globules which are surrounded by protein and phospholipids and those globules are various different sizes as they're, as they're secreted into milk um, and, and uh, released by the cow and you know the key thing with homogenization of milk is that uh, sort of standardization of milk fat globules. So let's talk about milk fat synthesis and the key here is really this relationship and where our, our research program is kind of focused is the relationship between the, the diet and the fatty acids coming into the diet, the effects they have in the rumen, and then ultimately what, what nutrients, what fatty acids are being supplied to the mammary gland and how that impacts milk fat composition, milk fat content, milk fat yield. <clears throat> there are two ways that mammary gland uh, makes milk fat. Um, and these are simply broken up to what we call de novo fatty acids. So those fatty acids made in the mammary gland, de novo, 
And these are the short to medium chain fatty acids, so butyrate, C4, all the way up to all of the meristics, uh, 14 carbon fatty acids. These are made from acetate and butyrate, so two and four carbon uh, units that are produced during fiber fermentation in the rumen. And then we have the long chain fatty acids, so the uptake of preformed fatty acids that are already in that fatty acid form. And this is all of the 18 carbons and longer fatty acids. So these are either coming from the diet or from mobilization of adipose tissue. So that, you know, breakdown of body fat. The key thing here is these two shown in red, particularly palmitic acid. Uh, this can come from either de novo fatty acids, so elongation of that two and four carbon units up to 16 carbons, or it can come from the diet as well. So this is where we've got talking about some of this palmitic acid and palm fat um, issues uh, in those articles. As I said earlier on, milk fat is predominantly triglycerides. If we all remember high school chemistry, triglycerides are simply a triglyc uh, glycerol backbone with three different fatty acids attached to it. OK, um, the key thing I'll show that in the next couple of slides here is that the lo location of where those fatty acids are on that glycerol is not random. There's a very tight control of where those fatty acids are. And that's a key component here of, of maintaining uh, milk fat synthesis. Um, this provides the mammary gland with what we call that plasticity to secrete triglycerides into droplets that can be incorporated in milk. And the key here, be fluid at body temperature. If you think, you know, we talked about butter being uh, how hard butter was um, in the form of butter. What that mammary gland has to do, and I think this is a big take home from, from today here, that what that mammary gland always has to do is to produce and secrete lipid or milk is uh, liquid at room uh, body temperature, okay? And how she does that is from what we talked about earlier on, makes these uh, short chain de novo fatty acids, and it has some of these unsaturated fatty acids here. And depending on what nutrients, what fatty acids are reaching the mammary gland, she's gonna shift how that milk fat is made, which fatty acids being used and how they are incorporated onto this triglyceride, onto this glycerol backbone in order to maintain that fluidity there. What we know in that triglyceride synthesis, and this is important for uh, one comment later on, is that palmitic acid is a significant um, initiator of triglyceride synthesis. So our research and research of others is simply shows if we can supply more palmitic acid to the mammary gland, it will help her make more milk fat. And when milk fat is a key component on how producers are paid for their milk, there's obvious reasons here why we may want to promote more milk fat synthesis. <clears throat> and palmitic acid is a key part of that. It's not the only part, but it is a key part of this. What is really interesting, as I talked about earlier on, is that plasticity and how those fatty acids are incorporated onto that glycerol backbone. So these SM positions are just simply the different positions, one, two, and three on the glycerol backbone. What you will see is nearly all of that butyrate, C4, is found in that final position on the glycerol backbone. And the same with C6. The reason being, these are have very, very low melting points, very short chain fatty acids. So these help maintain milk fat fluidity in those triglycerides. You can see that palmitic acid is found fairly evenly between you in positions one and two here. Now, when you look at what make up these triglycerols, these triglycerides, these fatty acids are making up the one, two, three positions here, you can see that the most common triglycerides found in milk fat contain palmitic acid and butyrate, as we show in here in red. And then the next most common all contain palmitic acid and oleic acid. So that oleic acid, most of it's coming from desaturation of stearic acid in the mammary gland, another key component of this maintaining milk fat fluidity. The mammary gland sees predominantly palmitic acid reaching it because of the end product of biohydrogenation in it can desaturate, convert stearic acid to oleic acid. So you can see here, these major triglycerides in the mammary gland are butyrate and palmitic acid and palmitic acid and oleic acid with other fatty acids coming around them. <clears throat> so really, please remember here that lipid synthesis is highly coordinated in order to produce this fluid milk fat. It has to be, okay, to make that fluid milk fat. So regardless of season, temperature, stage of lactation of the cow, the diet the cows are being fed. Number one goal of that mammary gland is to produce that fluid milk fat, okay? So as I just alluded to, many factors affected milk composition, genetics of the cow, stage of lactation, age, health, nutrition of the cow. You know, stage of lactation, we know, for example, milk fat composition changes hugely, whether, for example, she's in two weeks in milk or 25 weeks in milk. Um, 
different environments. You know, we know there's a lot of seasonality around milk composition. You know, typically milk fat com content, milk fat composition composition is different in those uh, longer day lengths, hotter periods of the year in the summer than it is in the winter. And uh, some of these things need to be taken into account, much more so, I think, than a single feed ingredient. So there, there, there's data here to support this. And of course, I always uh, are drawn to the data around some of these things. And this is a couple of papers published uh, 10 years ago now from my uh, uh, my former mentor, Dr. Bauman's group at Cornell University, where they were looking at uh, doing some survey work of fatty acid composition of retail milk based on different label practice, label and production management practices, and then looking at regional and seasonal effects. So I just wanted to show these very quickly here. First one here was looking at uh, milk that was labeled as conventionally produced milk, um, RBST free milk, which is uh, quite a hot topic back uh, 10 years ago, and then milk labeled as being coming from cows produced organically or managed organically. And, and you can see there, the, you know, these are those major fatty acids. There's probably about 10 fatty acids make up the vast majority of milk fat. Um, and you can see that they're all very highly significantly different here. But you can see that the magnitude of change when you look across these fatty acids is quite small. Um, you know, palmitic acid is typically uh, the, the most prevalent fatty acid found in milk. And actually, in this in this work here, cows uh, fed organically because they'd be typically receiving more pasture, which is often the highest fat content diet a cow will see. They, cows on organic milk in this um, fed organically typically have higher levels of palmitic acid in their milk than those fed conventional diets. Um, and, and there's lots of other, but these are all pretty small differences here. And remember, this all kind of ties into that maintenance of being able to make that fluid milk fat. When, you, when they looked at regional and seasonal differences, again, they're just showing the average milk fat composition here and the region, season, and in some cases there's interaction between the region and the season here. And again, you know, there are always going to be these differences. And then they showed here, they just broke it into these big groups. You know, maybe not the best way to look at it now, but it certainly works. And again, I think it's important just to show why there are differences here across regions and across uh, time of the year. If we just look at focus on saturated fatty acids, these are significantly different, but the magnitude of the differences here are pretty small, okay? So there are some of these differences here that, that we need to be aware of, but again, this isn't all down to, to one specific feed ingredient. So let's talk about fat supplements and that palm oil, uh, palmitic acid that, that, that's being talked about here. Um, one of the reasons, well, since the 1990s, I guess, really, that we've had a lot more interest in um, feeding fats is the energy supply. You know, we all know from our high school chemistry that fatty acids contain about just over twice as much energy as carbohydrates and proteins. So when we when traditionally when we were looking to get more energy into the cow's diet, we would often consider some of these fatty acids. Now, where research has gone probably the last decade is, is moving just beyond energy and looking at the biological effects that different fatty acids have, and palmitic acid uh, being one of them. But let's talk about this palm terminology. Some of those articles previously to referred to palmitic enriched and palm oil or palm fat in the same, same wording and using them um, interchangeably. They're not interchangeable. They're very different there. Palm oil, you know, or palm fatty acid distillate, as, as you're often seeing, um, contains predominantly palmitic acid and oleic acid. Uh, these palmitic enriched supplements uh, are, you know, 80 to 90 percent palmitic acid. So this this terminology here is not the same. You know, people have used calcium salts of palm oil or palm fatty acid just for a long time now. That's basically a uh, co-product or a waste stream straight from palm oil manufacturing and contains about 50 and 35 percent palmitic and oleic acid. Now, when the palm industry strip off oleic acid, and utilize that in human foods and in cosmetics and different things. What's left over is this palmitic acid in rich stream, anywhere 80 to 90%. And that can be converted into these uh, prills and uh, can be an excellent source of palmitic acid for dairy cow diets. Okay. Um, now, remember that these fatty acids or palmitic acid in particular is not only found in this, these type of products. Palmitic acid is typically the third and sometimes the second most prevalent fatty acid in dairy cow diets. Those, these five major fatty acids here are found in all feed ingredients, just in, in different proportions. But just be aware of this terminology that palm oil, palmitic acid enriched aren't the same thing. OK, 
you know, we've done work before. This is uh, uh, research that my uh, former postdoc, uh, my postdoc and former PhD student, uh, Jose Neto, Jonas D'Souza, have looked at different types of fat supplements. And in general, fat supplements improve the yield of milk and milk fat. And uh, we've done most work with calcium salt to PFAD and these palmitic enriched prills of late. As I talked about earlier on, the key with palmitic acid is that there is a nice relationship that the more palmitic acid the cow consumes. Now, some of this is coming from um, uh, every every feed ingredient in the diet, and, and we're often driving this by feeding more of those palmitic enriched supplements. There is a nice relationship that as you increase palmitic acid intake, you increase milk fat yield. And that comes down, we believe, to the fact that A, palmitic acid helps improve fiber digestibility in the rumen, very consistent response. And B, palmitic acid helps initiate triglyceride synthesis in the mammary gland. So the more palmitic acid there, the more triglycerides can be produced, more milk fat yield we can drive. Now, the key is, does feeding some of these different fat supplements alter milk fatty acid content, milk fat composition? And so we've started looking at that in some of these meta-analyses that we presented uh, a couple of years ago at, in, um, at Dairy Science. And uh, this this uh, this table here is from a paper that's uh, halfway through being reviewed, and the next table I show is about to be submitted. We looked at overall picture of what happens when you supplemented it. Here I'm showing calcium salt to palm fatty acid. Remember these products are um, palmitic acid and oleic acid mixtures, and and compared that to diets that didn't receive any fat supplementation. And you can just see here, positive numbers are um, if that fatty acid increased its content in milk, negative numbers decreased. So you can see there, as you'd imagine, we feed more palmitic acid, we feed more oleic acid, we increase the content of them in milk. But in response to that, particularly with the palmitic acid here, these medium chain saturated fatty acid content goes down and butyrate goes up. And exactly kind of what I was talking about around that regulation earlier on. So again, she's uh, that mammary gland is producing that fluid milk fat and how she's doing that is subtly different, but it's going to have a similar melting point, I believe, um, I feel, because it's being secreted as a liquid milk fat in, in, in the um, into, into milk. Now, if we look at these uh, palmitic acid enriched uh, supplements in, in this table here, it's this palm column that you see here. These are these palmitic acid enriched supplements. Again, you see some differences here. You go from the control diet to the palm diet, palmitic's going up. And then, but you see some of these uh, medium chain saturated fatty acids in terms of their content is going down in milk. Okay, so again, we've got this really close regulation here. Now, where we do need to do some more work, and this, this last week has got me thinking more about this, is that we do need to try and work more with a dairy food scientists to get some more data on melting points. And I've reached out to a couple of people about that already. But uh, there's, there's no data out there that I'm aware of right now that would show that some of these subtle differences would have any impact and <clears throat> on the on the um, manufacturing qualities of that milk fat. And I think the bigger take home for me here is that some of the differences you're going to see over season, stage of lactation, across a whole different management practices, whether the cows are confined herds or cows fed high, high levels of pasture, um, are going to have much bigger changes in milk fatty acids than I think altering one single feed ingredient here. I did find a couple of papers this morning. Both of these, I think, if I remember, came out of Denmark, where they are looking at some of the um, effects of uh, management feeding practices, uh, fatty acids, profile of milk and melting properties of cream. And, and this is not an area I'm an expert in, certainly, and I need to learn some more about this, but I thought these couple studies were in, in, interesting here. Uh, um, you can uh, look at these more yourselves. This study looked at different farms and some of the management and nutrition were on those farms. And the bottom line here was showing that there was no clear correlation between the feeding regime and the melting behavior of the, of the milk fat or the cream that was observed there. And you, they saw some differences here. I think it looks like people are lo uh, looking at milk fat in terms of the different uh, fractions, medium melt, melt, melting fraction, the higher melting point fractions there. And then from the same group there, they looked at cows either fed organically or conventionally across some different farms here again see some ranges in uh, fatty acid profile, again, that palmitic acid, consistent with what I showed from the Bauman's group earlier on, typically higher in some organic practices rather than conventional. Again, I think that's fresh pasture related. Um, and then they looked at some of the, the triglyceride weights here as well. But you can see again, actually in the 
high, medium and high, regardless of this profiles here, there was no differences in the melting fractions there, just in this low melting fraction, just uh, marginally here. Again, the significance of that, uh, we need to learn more about, okay? I think the big thing here, again, as I kind of, I thought earlier on, the seasonal variation of fatty acid composition was observed, and that variation was most pronounced organic milk. Makes sense. You're going to see a lot bigger changes in the seasonality of the diet-fed organic managed cows probably than conventional cows. Um, okay. Melting points of these different fractions had no differences between the dairies. It could not be related when they looked at correlations to fatty acid composition. So I do think that's an area we have to do a lot more work on in the future. Um, I Do I think a single feed ingredient such as palmitic acid, or palmitic acid rich substance is a factor in this? No, I, no, I do not. I think uh, we need to look some more at that. But I think the, my take home from that is that the mammary gland, uh, very exquisite control of making milk fat. And it balances out the fatty acids that are available in the mammary gland uh, with that de novo synthesis, that desaturation of steric to LA primarily, and how those fatty acids are put on that triglyceride in order to make that milk fat that can be uh, secreted as a fluid milk fat at body temperature. So as I said here, just some take home messages, this highly coordinated process making milk fat in the mammary gland. Um, very complex. Uh, when we've looked at this, one of the key things that alters the source of the fatty acid actually is dry matter intake. And there's something we need to look at more in the future as well. Uh, as I said, um, pardon me there, um, is one of the most diverse lipid matrix, matrix, matrices you're going to find anywhere in nature. Um, palmitic acid uh, sub, uh, fed in the diet is a very effective strategy to help and promote milk fat synthesis. Uh, melting point of milk fat is affected by the profile and, and the triglyceride structures. Again, this is highly coordinated. It has a requirement to produce that fluid milk fat. And as I said, short chain de novo fatty acids and desaturation is key. And there's going to be variation in milk fatty acid profile related to stage of lactation, season, individual cows and, and nutrition. We need to do more research and looking at dietary and management changes and the functional properties of milk fat. So I hope this has been helpful. Anyone has any questions or comments, there's my email address and uh, feel free to re reach out to me. So thank you very much.